Pleasant good afternoon, everyone. I'm Max Wellington, professor in the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, and I will be chairing today's chapel proceedings, which will also serve to connote the opening ceremony of our research week 2021. As is protocol in all things here at NCU, we will first accede to the throne room of our great and awesome God as we invite his divine presence and anointing on our deliberation. Because as Moses declared in Exodus 33, if your presence does not go up with us, do not send us from here. And so at this time, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Ruel Hay, who will delight us with some of his instrumental worship songs as we focus on our God. And that will be followed by a prayer and a devotion by Pastor Damian Chambers, Assistant Professor, School of Religion and Theology. Right, thank you. It's over to you, Mr. Hay.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Vigilance. I am the Director of Research in the Office of Graduate Studies and Research. It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to our annual Research Week proceedings at the Northern Caribbean University in this year of our Lord 2021. This year's conference is remarkable in that it is the first time in the history of this institution that a research conference is being held in the virtual space. This event reflects the theme of the conference, research mitigating challenges for sustainable development in the new normal. Over the past year, our world has experienced the power of a microscopic particle to impact the way we live in ways that most persons alive have not previously experienced. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the connectivity of communities separated by thousands of miles, made vulnerable by our shared humanity. It has allowed us to see science in action and how the work of many scientists over the course of several decades can assist humanity in a time of need. The investment in science has proven beneficial once again. While the existential crisis posed by the SARS-CoV-2 virus has allowed humanity to cooperate to promote our survival, it has opened up areas of new research not previously possible. The study of infodemics spawned by the social media deluge of accurate and inaccurate information about COVID-19 has occupied the minds of communication and behavioral science specialists. The curfews, lockdowns, and imposed public health measures, among other effects, have provided the opportunity for advanced social psychological studies in an effort to understand and manage human behavior and to study how societies can better prepare for other existential crises, which are sure to occur as long as there is human life on earth. It is clear that normality and crises alike provide the opportunity for research that informs how we adapt in a world that is dynamic. I take this opportunity to congratulate our students and faculty members on their ardent efforts and research productivity. Graduate students in the Colleges of Education and Leadership, Natural and Applied Sciences, Allied Health and Nursing, Humanities, Behavioral and Social Sciences, the College of Business, and our undergraduate students, in particular our nursing students and those in the School of Religion and Theology and Behavioral Sciences undergraduate students will be sharing their research findings with the campus community and our stakeholders over the course of four days. The College of Business and Management had their symposium earlier today and tomorrow, the 21st Science Symposium is scheduled, and I invite you to attend that symposium. On Wednesday, February 24th, the College of Education and Leadership will host the first William Smith Lecture Series in honor of our highly esteemed former Dean and Vice President of Academic Administration, Dr. William Smith, now deceased. Also on Wednesday, the College of Humanities, Behavioral and Social Sciences will be hosting their symposium. And at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, the nursing symposium will begin with an opening ceremony to mark the 50th year of existence of our nursing school. That symposium continues on Thursday with talks by a number of accomplished nursing alumni. Also on Thursday, the School of Religion and Theology will be conducting their symposium under the sub-theme, Research for Effective Mission and Ministry 
in the new normal. This year, our inter-college research competition focuses on the research output of each college. So, the colleges were asked to provide evidence of their research output to the panel of assessors. This criteria can be found in our Research Week Bulletin and includes and requires both faculty and students being productive. The assessors would also be visiting the conference rooms and will make a determination concerning the impact or potential impact of the research being presented by faculty and students. This, of course, will contribute to the overall score of the college or school and determine the placing in the inter-college research competition. So our research week will climax on Thursday, February 25, with a closing ceremony at which the winners of the inter-college competition will be announced. The theme for this year's research week, research mitigating challenges for sustainable development in the new normal, reflects the consistent need for research that is responsive to the human situation. I welcome you students, faculty, visitors, our stakeholders, to a week of learning outside of the usual virtual classroom. It is my hope that as you participate in our first virtual research week celebration, you will not only be informed by the work of our researchers, but you will also be educated, inspired, and motivated to improve our individual societies and our world by your research efforts. Welcome.
President Professor Lincoln Edwards, members of administration, director of research, Dr. Vigilance, faculty, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen, pleasant good afternoon. The graduate studies area is delighted to identify with the area of research during research week 2021. Operating in the new normal opens the avenue for research to be pursued in almost all philosophical areas. The opportunity is created for new, theology, new theories, developments, technologies, and methodologies to be formulated. If organizations, institutions, establishments, countries do not implement changes to cope, they will find that in a short while, they will be left behind. Northern Caribbean University has seen the need for immediate adjustments to the normal way of operating. So this research week with its organizers seek to share current trends, innovations, theories, philosophies, discoveries that will enlighten participants guests, students, faculty members, staff, stakeholders, and interested individuals. This research week should see the creation of new knowledge that will enable individuals to function efficiently in the new norm. This forum should have presentations and displays that will enhance our abilities. This is called research celebration because outcomes are as a result of weeks and months of hard work, dedication, and patience. This involves in-depth research reviews, in-depth analysis, evaluation, recommendations, and thoughtful postulations. The area of graduate studies expects that this forum will result in the promotion of interdisciplinary partnerships and collaborations that will strengthen participants as they operate in their various spheres. May the outcome of this week's activities satisfy and meet the needs of everyone who participates and set the stage for greater discoveries as we face this world filled with technological advancement. God bless you all. Dr. Lincoln Edwards, President of Northern Caribbean University and other members of the administration. Dr. Vigilance, Director of Research, other faculty and staff, students, well-wishers, good afternoon. One of the challenges we face in life, even as it pertains to a high depth of understanding in areas relevant to our existential processes is a lacking or apathetic approach to the academic discipline of research. It was as the 2017 Nobel laureates met for the annual Nobel Minds television program that Richard Henderson, a laureate in chemistry, affirmed that if the choice we make is close to the knowledge we have, then we are likely to have a successful research but we wouldn't have learned very much. However, if we make a bigger jump, take a bigger risk, and then most of the times the experiments will fail, but when it succeeds, we make a bigger jump forward. 
He, he further divulged that we should aim for a huge failure rate, a principal thought to him in his earlier days. So he interpreted that to mean 99%. The 1% that succeeds will take us with a very big step forward that is worth all the effort spent on the 99. Love for what we do, which is viewed in context of our fulfilling purpose, is the foundational strength for endurance. If change is adjudged in context of innovation, then this core philosophy finds meaning in its application as its further impact is the society we aim to shape. Vision is a light when shone upon our dark souls, identifies the premise for a creative nature coming to life. If vision isn't revealed, then it must be founded through research. Even God implores that we can only find him when we have searched for him with all our hearts. I encourage you then, as stakeholders of Northern Caribbean University, to love research and to bring meaning to life through your research. Even so, ensure what you research is based on your desire for humanity's adaptation, but edged in your own life's impetus. Thank you. Good afternoon, students, faculty, staff, administrators of Northern Carmen University. Thank you to the research committee for the privilege of sharing in this devotional exercise. This afternoon, I want to address you on a topic. The most important research question is hypothesis and conclusion. Let us pray. Father in heaven, speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit as we open up your words seeking for inspiration and guidance in these challenging times. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The research question is, what is most important or what are the most important pursuits in life? You know, COVID-19 taught my family that and myself when everything was locked down and we couldn't go anywhere to pursue anything. What was really most important? You know, did you know that King Solomon actually did a research into this question several years ago? And the documentation is there for us to examine. And that's what I'll be doing in my presentation. The research question that Solomon asks is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 3. I read from the NIV version. It says, Solomon says, he did all what he did. He says, I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. That's the research question. Solomon says, I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. In other words, where can true happiness be found? Where can I tr find true lasting satisfaction? What is the most meaningful pursuit in life? That was the main question that Solomon asked. One of the things that I know about research is that it is usually done by those who have the time, the resource, and the money to pursue um, the question. Or any of us can get up and ask questions, but very few of us have the opportunity to pursue that question in a systematic way, in a peer-reviewed way, in a way that will be accepted by society and verified by scientific fact. Well... In Solomon's case, he had the resource <laughs> to pursue this question. He had the resource to pursue all that was meaningful and all that he thought was meaningful to pursue in life. Before I get into that though, I want to address a second thing about the research question. It's not just about asking any question. Every research question that we ask must be challenged with a so what. Okay, so... so I'm asking this question, I'm going to pursue it, I'm going to spend money, but so what? What if I get the result? What impact will it have? Well, Solomon is saying, when I'm done with this research, then others, especially the young people, 
will not have to utilize the same resources that I did. They don't have to waste their time in trying to find those things out. I'm going to give you the conclusion. I'm going to verify if my hypothesis is correct. And so Solomon also did his so what question. And so in this research, Solomon had one independent variable and several dependent variables. The independent variable was our happiness or happiness of the human heart or satisfaction, fulfillment. That was the independent variable. And the dependent variable or variables, he outlined, he outlined the dependent variables in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 down to verse 8. He says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. One of the, one of the deepest need of the human heart is the need to have a home. But most of us don't just want any ordinary home. We want a nice home. And, and, and Solomon said he had the resource to acquire great building and, and gardens and parks and fruit trees. He, he had it when it comes on to acquiring a home. That was one independent variable. Solomon asked the question, will this make me happy? Then he also had, in addition to his home, in verse 6, he said he had reservoirs of water. He said, I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. Then also Solomon had female and male servants that were born in his house and those that he bought. He said, I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than anyone in Jerusalem, he says. He also gathered to himself silver and gold, verse 8, and the treasures of kings and provinces. Some modern day economics try to calculate Solomon's wealth. And they came to the conclusion that he had an annual income of 709 million US dollars. And so he had a net worth of 40 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money. He, he, that was an dependent variable. Will this make me happy? Besides house and pools and silver and gold, Solomon also had entertainment. He says, I got me singers, both men and women. He, he had personal entertainment. Today's society, we would probably have our own component set or so on, but Solomon had the singer to come to his house and sing for him. Will that make him happy? And finally, the final dependent variable was that Solomon had a lot of women. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. First Kings chapter 11 verse 3 tells us. That's a dependent variable. When you put it on the independent variable, will it affect, how will it affect the happiness of the human heart? And based on his experience and an initial literature gathering, Solomon came to this hypothesis to say that all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. That was the hypothesis that Solomon put. There's one more independent variable that I'll tell you about in a little while. But let me give you the reason that Solomon came to this hypothesis. The reason is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verses 16 to 18. Solomon says, For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten how the wise dies just like the fool so i hated life solomon says because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and striving after wind i hated all my toil in which i toil under the sun seeing that i must leave it to the man who will come after me solomon is speaking to a university student. Solomon is speaking to a worker, to a graduate. Solomon is, is, is examining this re important research question. What is meaningful to pursue in life? What is meaningful to spend table? 
all of them proved to be vanity and vexation of the spirit regarding its impact on the satisfaction of the human heart because at the end of the day, we are all going to die and leave it. And to add insult to injury, Solomon says that you don't even know, in verse 19 of chapter 2, you don't even know whether the person who is going to inherit your hard-working labor is a fool or a wise. You don't know if he's lazy or if he's hard-working. And this added to his frustration. And so he says in verse 5 to 6 of chapter 9, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. And Solomon says, that added to his frustration, all his vanity and vexation of the spirit. But I'm happy that the research results show that Solomon did not stop there. I'm happy that Solomon's hypothesis was proven to be incorrect. I am happy, my brothers and sisters, that Solomon has a conclusion that we can delight in and find great wisdom in. He had one more dependent variable that he had needed to, to, to test on his hypothesis. And Solomon, my brothers, my friends, Solomon successfully defended his dissertation. And Solomon earned his PhD in the meaning of life. And he is now a lecturer in the school of life. He is now an expert witness in answering the question about what is worth pursuing in life. And so Solomon says to young people in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, as a lecturer in life, he says to young people, Oh, young man, rejoice in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. What Solomon was basically saying was that the dependent variables that he used were only looking at the things that had to do with this life. He was looking at the, the money and the, and the women and the, the, the partying. But he had one last one to put to it. Solomon says, therefore, here is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In other words, that last dependent variable, when it was put to the hypothesis, when it was put to the, to the, happy, to the independent variable, it was found to have a positive impact on the lasting desires and satisfaction of the soul. It was found to have a lasting impact on the life and upon the heart. And so Solomon concluded that of all the things that can bring happiness, money will fail. And Solomon has some sample cases that he can present, my brother and sisters. Today we can look at Michael Jackson who in 2013, his, his net worth was 600 million US dollars. But when he died, he died a broke man and he died of a broken heart. Michael Jackson, in order to prove that the earlier dependent variables are correct, he wanted to be placed in a, in a type of um, tomb that would preserve his life forever. But somehow Michael Jackson did not read all the literature that Solomon presented. <laughs> the evidence is there, brothers and sisters. So what will make you happy? Having a relationship with Jesus Christ. What is worth pursuing? 
It is to fear God, the fear of God, and being obedient to his commandments, having a heart that is in harmony with God. And the only thing that can do that is when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and Jesus forgive us of our sins and lead us to surrender our lives to him. We have also have some sample size. We have some case studies that we can present to you to say this is true. The woman at the well in St. John chapter 4, she had many husbands and none of them satisfied her. But the day she found Jesus, she was able to rejoice and say, come see a man who satisfies my heart. For years, like the songwriter says, like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. But then I found my savior and he fulfills my cup and make it overflow. So Solomon has done the research, he says. And he says to you, young people, you do not need to make the mistakes that I made. You do not need to waste the time that I wasted. I have done the research. It might cost you too much. Matter of fact, you may not be able, you may not get enough time to come to the conclusion. So take my conclusion because the evidence is there. My research has been peer reviewed and published in a top journal, the Bible. Read it for yourself. Examine the data and you will see that happiness is to know the Savior. You will see that happiness is to know Jesus and to have our lives in harmony with him. This is the most important research question. And that is, what is worth pursuing in life? Solomon had an earlier hypothesis to say that all is vanity and vexation of his spirit. But when he tested serving God, when he tested surrendering his life to God, he found that yes, his conclusion is that his earlier hypothesis was wrong. Fear God and keep his commandments. But this is the old duty of man. I myself was a student at Northern Carbon University at age 19 when I made that decision to surrender my life to Jesus and to give my heart to him. It has been a wonderful experience. My life for the past 20 odd years has been a complete fulfillment. I've had my challenges, yes, but I have meaning and purpose in life today because I found Jesus. I pray that you will find the same experience here at Northern Caribbean University. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the research that Solomon did and for the results and for the conclusion that to find true purpose and meaning in life, we must surrender our lives to you we pray and say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. The Division of Academic Administration at Northern Caribbean University is delighted to welcome you all, our students, workers, guests, and stakeholders, to this virtual research week 2021 under the theme Research mitigating challenges for sustainable development in the new normal. Among the responsibilities of institutions of higher education is that of providing solutions to the challenges that face our global communities in an effort to sustainably and consistently enhance the lives of others as we strive to exist gregariously in our global village that is so tightly networked that our lives wherever in the world we may be, continue to impact the lives of others. Even as the COVID-19 pandemic has been the hallmark of the lives of Jamaicans since March 10, 2020, and the source of great discomfiture worldwide since 2019, 
we have been provided with the opportunity to face the realities of the fifth industrial revolution, even prior to our real and stated readiness to meet these goals that have been set before us. Because our mission as a Seventh-day Adventist institution of higher education is inextricably interwoven with that of service to others, we as a university continue to support the sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda of the United Nations. And as has been espoused in an article found at the website educationindiajournal.org, we at Northern Caribbean University have been revisioning the role of higher education for sustainable development, which involves changing the means and processes of knowledge production and the way in which students are trained, making students more socially responsible, critical and sensitive towards sustainability issues lifelong. It is my hope but as a result of the thought-provoking presentations and deliberations into which we, as a university, along with our stakeholders, will enter, we shall find sustainable solutions to our ongoing concerns as an institution, as a nation, and as a people, as a direct result of the activities and events of Research Week 2021. Welcome to the Northern Caribbean University Research Week 2021, which is being held under the theme Research, Mitigating Challenges for Sustainable Development in the New Normal. As we ponder this theme, I am sure we can all agree that it is judicious for such a time as this. The term New Normal is now a buzzword as we deal with the challenges brought on by the pandemic, and I believe that from henceforth, and for a long time to come, COVID-19 will become a yardstick and we will refer to time as before COVID and after COVID. However, as a people, I am confident that we are strong, we are resilient, and we will not despair. We will bounce back. Here at NCU, our workers and students will continue to positively contribute to the national research endeavors, which I believe will assist in mitigating the challenges towards sustainable development. At NCU, we are just as committed to our various stakeholders, and so even though our courses are not now being offered in the physical brick and mortar space, we are still offering quality, Christ-centered education via the Aorian and other educational platforms. At NCU, our professors are involved in various research endeavors, such as investigation into the health benefits of hibiscus sabdarifa, or what we know commonly as sorrel, which has contributed to the development of a brand of sorrel juice mix currently on many supermarket shelves. Our researchers have also studied the use of the bauxite dirt for cement and the use of sugarcane and banana pulp in the making of paper, among other studies. In our presentation, which was reported in the February 2020 ed edition of the Gleaner, Claudine Allen, executive for member relations at the Jamaica National Group, advocated that Jamaica should invest more in research and science, pointing out that science and technology must become important economic drivers for the country's future. And according to universities uh, in Canada, basic research has led to some of the most commercially successful and life-saving discoveries of the past century, including, yes, you guessed it, vaccines and drugs, and the development of radio and television. And might I add that in an article that I wrote that was published in the Gleaner, on April 8, 2020, I propose that the Jamaican government assemble the key research institutions in this country with the aim of strengthening their research capabilities. Now, this was before the coronavirus took hold, and I still stand by this utterance. 
Research and development requires a large capital outlay over a sustained period of time that many universities are simply unable to include in their budgets. Therefore, I encourage you to write grants and seek funding for research endeavors, as a grant award will not only bring repute to you, the researcher, but to the institution with which you work. And most importantly, research findings are many times life-saving. So again, welcome to Research Week 2020, as we all endeavor to use research to mitigate the challenges for sustainable development in the new normal. Do enjoy the presentations. It is my privilege today to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Joseph A. Whitaker as our keynote speaker for this opening ceremony. Dr. Whitaker is currently the Vice President for Research and Economic Development and Associate Provost at Jackson State University. In these capacities, he provides support to the Provost in academic affairs and has responsibility for research, sponsored programs, regulatory compliance, technology transfer and commercialization, grants and contracts, and federal relations. Prior to joining GSU, Dr. Whitaker served as Dean and Professor of the School of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences at Morgan State University and simultaneously as Associate Director of the NASA Guest Star Program at the Goddard Space Flight Center. At MSU, Dr. Whitaker led the development and implementation of a number of research and academic initiatives. He served on a number of review panels for the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, National Oceanic and Atmospheric administration and other federal agencies. Early in his academic career, he led efforts in the design and construction of the Neuroscience Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine, which became the prototype for 12 additional NIH specialized neuroscience programs. He holds several board and committee memberships and was elected the 73rd president of Sigma Phi Scientific Research and Honor Society. Dr. Whitaker received his PhD in physiology and biophysics from Howard University and was a neurobiology postdoctoral fellow at the Neuroscience Center of Excellence at University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center. Today, he will be speaking to us on the topic, the research enterprise and the pursuit of possibilities. Hear ye him.
Hello? Um, good afternoon. Um, I didn't realize that we would have a um, musical interlude. Um, so my apologies if I got a little impatient there. So um, thank you for the invitation, um, President Edwards, Dr. Vigilance, Dr. Giles, and the entire research committee. Um, I am truly honored for the invitation to speak with you. And um, thank you for your timely subject matter in your, um, in your research program. I took the liberty because when I look at your um, title, um, looking at all the challenges that we're currently facing, not just in research, but globally, I took the liberty of modifying my presentation to talk about a research enterprise and the pursuit of possibilities. Um, not quite a departure from where you are, but um, my thought was I would focus mainly on the university and its research enterprise and some of the issues that we normally have on, a, on an academic environment and then look forward to how we actually face and overcome these challenges. And I think the idea and some of the themes that have been expressed before are absolutely on target in terms of how we really solve problems and find solutions based on research. Um, and for the young people especially, um, we see how creative you are on social media, um, but in terms of thinking long-term about how you propel your goals and professions long um, for the future, we want you to continue to be as creative in the classroom as well as in the, in the laboratory or out in the field, regardless, regardless of where your research take you. Um, the advice really from me at this point, especially to the young students, it's not about learning techniques or skills. It is really about that inquisitive, inquisitiveness you have, that curiosity and creativity that you can actually hone and develop to find meaningful solution for um, helping all of humankind. So um, part of that process actually, which is something that we fail to recognize quite often is we also need to learn all the things that could derail your pursuit <laughs> of the possibilities that you do have in mind. And as you learn your skills, that will take you through that on the path for possibilities because with research, you never know where it might lead. You have one thing in mind, but it can take you in many different directions. Um, so in critical moments, movement, moments, you need to have, understand how those skills that you have can be paired with the creativity and the innovation to find meaningful and, and paths to success. You can fail and failure is not always a bad thing failure of lifelong lessons that that will help us to do much better and enables us getting through difficult moments successfully so do not shy away from or fear being uh failing when you attempt um to answer uh, significant questions in your life so um today i'm going to take a little take a moment to talk a little bit about how we navigate some of these disruptions and challenges. Um, before, before COVID and the pandemic came along, we talked a lot about climate change and some of the implications there, about technology advances and the fact that we can hardly keep pace. And, you know, now that you have the pandemic, you've seen how people have rallied together very quickly, not understanding the organism that you can't even see, um, but to know how to approach it in order to find quick solutions. And, and I hope it's clear to everyone that what made it possible for the quick delivery of the vaccine, and not just one, but several possibilities, was the fact that people recognized that they could not do it alone. They had to find a team, they had to work together. So, so the pursuit of possibilities can take you in many ways and actually 
bring competitors together, um, focusing on the same um, topic um, in, in uh, many instances. So um, let me just frame some things for you in terms of um, the flow I'm, I'm trying to utilize today, and that is how we look at um, challenges and opportunities and take a global perspective of that. What's needed for us um, in general um, as, as, as a race, as, a, as, a, as people, and what the role of the university is in, in terms of addressing the needs and finding solutions um, through learning, through discovery, through innovation. And, and, you know, going forward, what do we do, especially um, my comments will be uh, about training and the young people who will be the next generation of researchers and scientists. Um, if we take the challenge to the level of the university, for example, there, there's a lot that I think most of you saw when, when COVID came along, and there's um, the classroom issues, residence hall, exposure uh, possibilities to faculty, students, staff, um, the, the ubiquitous use of technology in the classroom, which a lot of people were shying away from before, um, and the very demand of coll for collaborative interactions, both from the administration, faculty, staff, students, to actually come together to um, find ways to connect um, and to bring a level of readiness that's appropriate for you to respond and make sure, not just respond to provide the services and keep your values intact as you go forward, but to ensure that you can deliver the quality academic programs that you have to take care of the needs of all your stakeholders. Um, so underlying all of those decisions and that um, community spirit and collaboration is that you know, the essence of compassion, you have public health concerns, you have questions about whether we should do things face to face or, you know, virtual. Um, and then there's the old business model. How do we continue business as a university? Um, most people around would not look at the university as a business, but it is a business, um, regardless of how you look at it. Um, and so you have as a university of the responsibility of taking care of a lot of people. And so there was an invitation because of the pandemic for, you know, shared decision-making. And so your success and the ability that you have now to actually do this virtually, um, and I can assure you, I'll be happy to be there in Jamaica where it's nice and warm and I'd be home, but um, COVID had other plans. And so, <laughs> Here we are uh, with a virtual presentation. Um, your success um, is actually a reflection of the community spirit, the collaboration that took place, your commitment and the sacrifices on part of some people to make these things happen. I think you will recognize that during this process, a lot of things that you normally would take for granted also surfaced. So it wasn't all about the good things and things you have to do differently. But the things that you normally do, uh, you'll recognize some of them will have to change. It could be your policies, your processes, your procedures. And every one of these um, decisions have consequences. And um, I, I, I commend President Edwards and his, and his team for keeping things going and um, leading up to this point where you can continue your research day. Um, as a vice president for research, one, that was one of the biggest challenges for us to decide how we're going to have continuity. Um, everything we do in the university has an impact on the business model for the, for the campus. Um, as you see, my title says vice president for research and economic development. I also wear a, a number of other hats on the academic affairs side, um, the associate provost. Um, I'm in charge of most of the global programs. Um, so the international students, their housing, their welfare during this time when most cannot travel and leave the campus. All of these things are intrinsic, inherent challenges within a university that all of us have to deal with as, um, as leaders and administrators. And it takes everybody's um, 
talents and skills and opinions um, and sometimes people pushing back to get us back to reality um, in making the, the real critical decisions um, when the time comes. So um, how do we go through some of those new challenges? Of course, the challenges, some of the new, new challenges is um, all these new diseases may pop up. Um, you have a vaccine now that's um, based on messenger RNA. And if, if you understand some of the, how those work, um, the jury's still out on what those outcomes could be and what may happen in the future because there was not enough time to test a lot of these things in the longer term to see the implications. Um, so, but sometimes risk is inherent in, in a lot of research. It could succeed, it could fail. Clearly, if you know the answer, you would not be going about trying to do a research project. But um, some people try to do that to game to so so they can um, decide how they want to proceed. But to do ethical, honest research, you usually do not know the answer. You know the direction. You know where you want to go. Yeah, as you heard before, there's an hypothesis. It can be proven wrong. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is necessarily wrong. Um, it's just that you may have to rethink your questions. Um, if you pay attention to the literature. Um, you will notice that recently there's been a lot of um, publication that's being withdrawn because of different kinds of ethical violations. That is, become, that is becoming more of a critical issue when it comes to research and the appropriateness of how you do your research program or pursue a research question is critical. Um, the ethics and the research conduct um, you know, issues of falsification and um, plagiarism and, and fabrication of information and making up data and all of these things, doing modification of figures and uh, images. Those things are serious concerns now and, and um, creating a lot of issues in terms of the credibility of the science. Um, the other part is research security. Um, how do you protect the data that you do have and make sure it's utilized in the appropriate way? So universities in general are the, um, the site where there's a lot of data. We hold on to a lot of data. Um, when the government or the people in the private sector or companies who need access to that data to make real, real meaningful decisions, Many times the universities are not at the table. That data is not available to those individuals. And that's, in terms of looking forward, is something that we have to change. So part of the new normal going forward um, is for universities to start thinking about how they collaborate, how they change their structures internally to be more outward facing. Um, think of yourself as the center of the community that you're in and you should drive the economic engine that supports um, those, those areas. Um, so how do you, the, the universities see themselves as um, preparing students, creating new knowledge, enhancing academic quality and all of that. And, and that's usually your primary function. Now, with this, in this new era, with the advancement in technologies and, and the changes in um, the economy, um, there are lots of poverty, people filing bankruptcy, all kinds of things happening now. So it's not just about doing science or just in STEM, which you hear about all the time. And, and I'm a scientist, so I <laughs> STEM it is in my wheelhouse and it's fine. But we need the social scientists. We know we need the historians. We need all the people in the liberal arts and um, legal field and policy. Everybody has to play a role um, in terms of how we look at what we do in the laboratory, how we take discoveries from the laboratory into the um, community space and into the marketplace. That should be uh, one of those things that universities now emphasize. Many times universities are not equipped 
are highly resourced to drive um, the economic engine in their community. If you look at the United States and the current policies and direction of where things are going, they're relying heavily on universities to actually drive the economy. And so many are implementing um, technology transfer capabilities, translational research um, enterprises, and pushing for major partnerships with industry partners where the intellectual um, power that the universities have can be combined with those people who are making the widgets outside to make them bigger, better, faster, and far more applicable to human needs. So um, that's part of what I do in general. Um, as part of my job, if you heard about some of the things that were listed there as my responsibility. And let me just give you an example. Um, and it's, it's about changing our operations such that everybody on the campus, every unit, every research area, every academic area can come together to work seamlessly. The challenge for us is universities are usually um, organized in, in silos, in these little um, domains where people don't always interact um, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis in meaningful ways to drive in the academic programs. And so there's a new phase in interdisciplinary research that is required for us to move and to attack the big problems and the grand challenges um, that are there in science. And so what, what we need is that social cultural integration. What are the social implications of the discoveries that you make? Um, you, you president speak, spoke about things that went from the laboratory or the field to the market and the supermarket and all of these things. Those are meaningful things that you have to happen and you need to do more of that. But you have to make sure that that intellectual property and the process that you use continue to um, be done in a, um, an ethical way that protects not just the researchers in the university, but those individuals who are um, the consumers of the things that you're actually uh, putting in that space. Um, if you're using farm products, um, you want to make sure you do things to support the farmers and make them far more productive and um, to enhance what they do in, in meaningful ways. And so that interaction between the external environment of university and, and the activities within must be almost seamless so that you can drive um, future research and, and um, meaningful uh, endeavors. So we often do not have the policies and, and those things aligned to drive a lot of those activities. And sometimes um, the research and the activities will tend to uh, position you to determine what kind of policies, goals, and procedures you need. And so as you look for solutions and, and start thinking about um, innovation, um, you have to think about all of these, these possibilities to ensure that your operations are aligned with the activities that you have. And of course, this is within the context of, the, of your overall values for the university. At no time should you um, <laughs> get di distracted from that. You should still maintain your values as you pursue these goals. And let me just give you an example of um, what I did at um, Jackson State University. You heard about the Neuroscience Institute I developed at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. That was actually at a time when there were very few people like me um, who look like me and you um, who were doing neuroscience or brain research. And so I was told in one meeting that, you know, oh, black people can't do brain research and all of these things. So I actually challenged the system by offering to develop a concept to address this issue. And I think now more than ever, we need those kinds of bold moves. Um, I'm, I'm not telling the young people to do what I do, but uh, um, and I will give you the details of the approach because every one of these bold moves and, and actions um, have consequences and you have to weigh pros and cons. If the pros are the way the cons, go for it. Um, 
So I was threatened with all kinds of things. You know, you won't get promoted, you won't do this, you won't do that. But you cannot live your life on fear and um, taking a risk or taking a step out, right? Um, I think Martin Luther King said, <laughs> faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the, the old stair, staircase. Okay, so, and, and that's essentially um, a metaphor for what research is. You want to go after the unknown. If you already know the answer, there's no need to go searching and try and creative ways to do it. You see a lot of that now because some of the old answers we have, we knew the fundamental mechanisms to get there, but details were missing. Technology has helped to resolve some of those fundamental things, but the overall answer is still the same. And so as you pursue these things, your creativity, your imagination has to come into play. Um, it's not the techniques and the skills that you learn and follow recipes in the laboratory. It's, it's the thought process that goes above and beyond um, where you feel this. And so my goal was to change the landscape so that more people like me would have the opportunity. When I had my training as a neuroscientist, I was the only person, <laughs> black person, who was in that entire place um, at the time. And so I didn't think that that was something that was uh, unique. I just think that people did not have the opportunity to do it or took the chance. And so um, my job was to change that. And that was just a personal goal I had. And I was able to do something about it by establishing the first one in a, in a black institution in the United States. And that became a model for some others. Uh, fast forward where I am now, what I did was I got to this university uh, and my goal was to help the president there kind of move some things uh, on the campus. And I established a center for innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic development. And at first, nobody knew what that was. You know, he's crazy, he's doing something uh, out of the ordinary, What that doesn't mean anything to us. And it's because in the universities, we get so siloed in our thinking and so focused on our disciplines that we don't want to deviate from that. And so, in this era where you need interdisciplinary work, where you need collaboration, where you need convergence of disciplines. Um, a lot of people now won't do any research without having a sociologist by their side. And everybody say, why do you need that? You need the person to give you what the implication and the impact is in terms of societal um, benefits and all this, or, or sometimes it could be risk. But, you also need probably somebody from communication to help you to communicate exactly what you do and where you go and how is this going to work. And so I created this space with the help of a few people in my, in my unit to say, you know, here's this open space. And in that space, if you walk in, there's um, virtual reality, there's um, 3D printing, there's all kinds of things available um laser cutters everything and it, the idea was that you could you can go into this space and test any idea you want to test there are engineers there are designers there are art students there everybody's in that space and the goal is to make it free for anybody to go and interact and just talk about what they're trying to do so they can get assistance from anybody just sitting around so what you know here's what i'm trying to do what your skill sets are it also allows companies small business and in the community to come into that space interact with the scientists who are working on major problems every day who can assist them probably in design or changing their business model or you know going to a new in a new direction with whatever they're they're developing and so big companies come in they want a prototype, and we do that as um, challenges. I'm calling presidential challenges within the university where here's, a, here's the issue. This is what we want to build. We need <laughs> three or four prototypes. And teams of faculty and students actually come together and work on this. Um, and the CEOs are usually there to for reference to say, here are the specifications that I'd like, and, and you can 
you know, just go to them with questions as they work um, throughout several months to solve the problem. At the end of the day, the prototypes that result, um, the faculty um, or the CEO can decide which you want. Either way, the university shares in the IP. So if it goes out and gets manufactured, you know, their, their uh, revenue coming back to the university one way or the other. The prototypes that are not accepted, the university has its own right to refine those and do the same thing in, in another way. So the intellectual property protection, the technology transfer, filing patents, all of that, everything is done in-house. In and so we get people to start thinking very differently. And, and throughout this whole COVID um, pandemic, a lot of those kind of things happen from doing basic things like making masks and shields and all that stuff to far more complex things and sensors and things like that. So just being strategic and how you think about this, being multidisciplinary and making sure that you have the right agreements and, um, and processes in place to protect the students, faculty and the university itself um, while providing a meaningful kind of relationship and services with the community. Um, I will just say that um, finding solutions requires different approaches. It needs your scientists who are in the faculty to start thinking differently, working together. Um, you need them to help you and the people in the administration and the legal team to develop the right policies, um, the right communication um, themes so that you can have the end results and find the solution that you're seeking. Um, you know, if you think about the vaccine development in the pandemic, if, if they didn't have the right people working together, developing policies and the communication and everything, as, the, as they were building um, this, the vaccine, it wouldn't matter if the um, people in the community didn't want to take it or weren't, weren't prepared to, to take it. So it would have been a useless exercise and a very expensive one. And so it's important to have the transition. How do you solve these problems and how do you make sure you put a sustainable process in place so that the next generation can continue and improve on that. So we need the right leadership, we need the right innovators and people with unique passions to walk into spaces and just knowing exactly what they want to do. Um, not doing it <laughs> because somebody else did it that way, but to use their own creativity and imagination to do things differently. Um, with the siloed organization that universities currently have, um, it's very difficult sometimes to, trend, um, to transcend that, but I think it's important that we go undergo this structural transformation or you start thinking about that as a university to make things happen far more smoothly so that solving the big problems is, um, is become standard. Um, sure, you have to have the right accountability, you have, to right, have the right kind of incentives and make the right decision based on your values based on the data that you have to, to say what your resources are, what you're good at, um, what, where your challenges are, and how you have your resources aligned with your business model. Clearly, a lot of universities' business model is based on tuition and all of these things. Now you have to diversify. Okay, so we have to pretend we're on Wall Street. How can we diversify the portfolio so that we have multiple sources of revenue coming into the university um, to ensure long-term sustainability. Um, the agility. So you probably going to talk about um, the article you wrote about getting the universities together. Excellent idea, great start. And um, I hope it does happen. And I encourage you to continue to think along those lines. Um, I try my best to, in my experience, to do the things that will not just inspire others, but not, not for them to be like me, but to be better than I am. And I um, implore you that all of you who are mentored as students should start thinking about ensuring that these students understand that 
they should be better than you and not be like you. Um, it's no, <laughs> no reflection on, on you and, and the quality of what you do, but is to make sure there's a continuum of um, continuous improvement as we go through this. So as we look at future competitiveness and the challenges that are in front of us, there are a couple of things on, on, on the horizon and new frontiers in, in, when it comes to science and technology. We have to be able to scale ideas and the talent to solve the solutions that the, the problems that are um, coming in front of us. At the same time, we have to ensure there's an economic development and the resources being generated for that to happen. So having a strong research and development enterprise, um, there's so much, so many unique things that's happening in the world because of the part, the, in, the part, partnerships between universities and um, private industry, I, I should say. Um, and these are important connections to have as we support the ongoing research and prepare for the next generation. So having an ecosystem that catalyzes partnerships and have synergistic alliances with entities external to the university. Uh, you have to have a strong economic development system or ecosystem, one for the translation of research to ensure technology transfer, knowledge transfer, and increase innovation. Um, a strong learner system or ecosystem, um, one that's probably influenced through technology and automation, which is something like you're doing now with all these um, virtual um, capabilities that you do have, but is to generate uh, future master learners who are agile enough and with a mindset of in a mindset of success to actually drive future research um, endeavors. So those are some key areas that I think um, that is are critical uh, for the sustainability. You pick your mission carefully, um, ensure that you can put the best minds together to solve meaningful problems. In terms of our future competitiveness, a big part of that is about leadership. Who's really sitting at the table um, and who can um, bring the best talent and make the appropriate investments to, to drive um, the activities that, to solve the, the meaningful problems. And innovation and discovery, that's definitely needed um, as part of your overall mission and, and activities fully integrated with the academic enterprise to ensure that you can build a future and advance science and technology as you go. Um, clearly, with that in mind, it will um, kind of ensure that your training environment will be modified so that the next generation of scientists will come out as a, a workforce that's talented in multiple areas and can stimulate the kind of competitiveness that will dry, drive continuous improvement. Um, I think I will stop there and, and take questions. I, I think the future is in the hands of students and I hope that in your new paradigm as you think about the kinds of things that you're doing and build on the current um, research that you're doing is to think about how you shift from where you are to where you want to be and what it will take in order to succeed and, and have satisfactory outcomes. I will stop and now take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, so much for your very good presentation. We enjoyed it thoroughly, Dr. Whitaker. Unfortunately, we are in the virtual space today and we won't be able to field questions. I am going to, however, go right now into the vote of thanks, where I'm going to be thanking a number of persons who made today and this week possible. Um, before we close with the alma mater, I'd just like to express on behalf of the Office of Graduate Studies and Research appreciation for many persons who made today's proceedings possible. The hard-working team, the organizing committee, the 
persons who brought, brought the praise and worship for us this morning, this afternoon, sorry, for Pastor Damian Chambers, who brought the ministry of the word and prayer. And he left us with some very important words of wisdom. To members of the university administration and leadership who brought greetings. To our distinguished president, Professor Lincoln Edwards. Professor Paul Giles, Dean Graduate Studies. Dr. Jacqueline Vigilance, Director of Research. And Mr. Ruel Hay, President of the USM. Now the students are in good hands with him being at the helm. We thank you for your most valuable presence and contribution to this session. And of course to our erudite presenter uh, who came and gave us some very important pointers about strategies to incorporate research. And we thank him for his openness in sharing some of the challenges that he faced as he tried to embark on research programs in his sphere of existence. Dr. Joseph Whitaker, Vice President of Research and Associate Provost of Jackson University, Mississippi. We extend our deepest appreciation and we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to support our our program and for that very cogent and timely word in season. And to show, show you our appreciation, we're going to be sending you a little bit of our sunshine. Because we know you can use a little bit of it up there at this time. Lastly, I would like to extend thanks to CCMPR, NCU Media, and all the hardworking, dedicated researchers who will be presenting their findings during the course of the week. To all the session chairs and to the participants in the intercollegiate competition and the judges who will be judging that competition, may the best college win. And of course, we know who that is. Won't announce it right now, but we'll wait until the formal announcement. And thanks to anyone else who assisted, even though your name may not have been mentioned, we want you to know that your efforts are well, well appreciated. And we ask the Lord to send you a special blessing, because as the Bible says, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so at this time, we're going to be closing with our alma mater. And we want to just thank everyone who has logged in to listen to today's program. And we, we pronounce your blessing upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 